Jorge Kalchik is a historian in the departments of history and of Germanic and Slavic studies at the University of Victoria, where he's taught since 2001. He works primarily on the social and political history of the Stalin period, as well as the Ukrainian nation uh, from the mid 19th century to the present. He is the author or editor of several books on Russia and Ukraine, including three with OUP, including uh, Ukraine, Birth of a Modern Nation, Stalin's Citizens, and Ukraine, What Everyone Needs to Know, which will be publishing in a third edition later on in the year. He is originally from Kyiv and will be speaking today about the current war in Ukraine and the history of Ukraine's tumultuous history with Russia. I'm really pleased that he was able to make time in his busy schedule to join us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Serhei Yakelchik. Thank you, Angela, for an introduction. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for organizing this event. Every opportunity to speak about the situation in Ukraine is very much appreciated because this is what I'm thinking about all the time anyway. Might as well talk about it quite often as I do. So because it's a very short um, talk here today, only 30 minutes, I was told before the Q&A, I'm going to uh, use a slightly unusual format for it. Uh, first, I will um, discuss what it's not about, what the crisis in Ukraine is not about, and then I will very briefly speak to uh, what it is really about. So what it's not about, um, it's definitely not about the NATO expansion. Every time I get to speak on a panel with political scientists, especially somehow British political scientists, they always insist that the matter is somehow connected to the evil NATO and its intention to expand into Eastern Europe. And uh, I have to then remind them that NATO has only once considered um, the possibility of Ukraine being put on an accession path, not actually joining, but being put on this accession path. And that was in 2008, and in 2008, this issue was decisively rejected. And a signal was sent to everybody that neither Ukraine nor the Republic of Georgia, another candidate considered at the time, would ever be a candidate for admission to NATO. Um, so NATO doesn't really want um, countries with uh, conflicts, with uh, contested territorial issues and such. And it definitely didn't want to expand into Ukraine, which is huge. Uh, the size of France actually is largely, slightly larger than France in territory. Uh, and with all kinds of issues connected to the post-Soviet transition. Um, Ukraine, however, ex has expressed its desire to join Europe. Um, but Europe here needs to be understood as a metaphor because um, the entire revolution in Ukraine in 2013-2014 was fought over the issue of becoming a member of the European Union, but I think it was greatly misunderstood because uh, uh, most people believed that it was in fact the issue of membership in the European Union, whereas what was um, on the table at the time was actually the association agreement with the European Union which was primarily about aligning the legislation and technical standards with those used in Europe, and also allowing the free market um, trade between the European Union and the country in question. So it was not about membership. The European Union up until uh, very recently did not consider Ukraine a candidate and for, for a variety of reasons, economic and such, it was not considered a serious candidate. So what it means then is that Somehow everybody in Eastern Europe is imagining something about Europe, quote unquote. Uh, Russia imagines that everybody wants to join NATO, and this may well be true now, that Russia is behaving this way, that everybody is indeed very much willing to join NATO. But, but it really is about something else. Um, it's about, for, you, for the Ukrainian revolutionaries in 2013, it was definitely not about the real European Union, of which they knew very little, of this immense bureaucracy, quotas for production, um, the need to reconcile the opinions of member states on any issue, including as we saw recently on the issue of um, response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so the Europe they imagined was a different one, the Europe characterized by the rule of law, uh, characterized by economic opportunity for everybody, a serious uh, struggle against corruption, and first of all, democracy. 
that's a different idea there. So we are misreading um, really the way uh, the terms Europe and NATO are used in that part of the world. And Russia, of course, uses NATO for everything. And every time uh, there is democracy, uh, uh, there is a president somewhere not being re-elected. This is, of course, NATO, because NATO stands for everything bad and the Russian type stability stands for everything good. What it's also not about, and what I hear quite often on panels in which political scientists, not just British, but all kinds of political scientists are mixed with historians, is that it really is about the Soviet Union. That uh, President Putin's intention is to bring back the Soviet Union, and I keep reading about it even last night, really, on, on CNN, BBC, anywhere. Um, but that's not quite true. Mr. Putin did say at some point, a long time ago, that the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of our time. But what he's trying to do in Ukraine and elsewhere is not quite that, for two reasons. Reason number one, um, the Soviet Union consisted of 15, at some point even 16, but um, during his last, during its last decades of 15 constituent republics. Ukraine was one of them. And having your own union republic, uh, a constituent member of the union, was tantamount to a recognition of uh, the right to self-determination. It was also the recognition that you constitute a separate ethnic nation. So the Bolsheviks, in fact, did recognize that Ukrainians were a separate ethnic group from Russians. The Bolsheviks had to recognize it because of the developments during the revolution in Ukraine in 1917-1920. And so the Bolsheviks then acknowledged that fact by creating, admittedly, a puppet republic, but nevertheless a republic um, in Ukraine. Also because there had already been another non-Bolshevik Ukrainian republic in 1917. There was a precedent to which they had to respond. But Mr. Putin actually goes beyond that because according to his rather rumbling speeches and some of his publications, he actually uh, wrote an article about the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians that was published in July 2021. His speech on the first day of the all-out invasion basically repeated all the main points of this article. So according to him, it's not just um, kind of a different ethnic group which is close, the fraternal people. But Ukrainians are actually part of the same ethnic nation as Russians. And that is a very curious term, which causes quite a bit of confusion, actually, at some round tables. But it is very familiar to me because early on in my career as a historian, I was working on the 19th century, on the second half of the 19th century. And that's precisely the reason when the Russian Empire, the Tsars, argue that Ukrainians do not exist as a separate ethnic group. Uh, that is precisely the reason why um, Tsarist Russia banned all the publications in the Ukrainian language and importation of books in the Ukrainian language, because it didn't want to acknowledge them as a separate nationality, as a separate ethnic group. It realized also the power of modern <clears throat> nationalism, which of course in the 19th century is connected to very progressive notions of democracy, destroying the multinational empire, things like that. So Mr. Putin then is not going back to the Soviet Union. Um, he does like some things about Soviet Union, like the nuclear arms, like Stalinist terror, really. Um, but there are things that he doesn't like. And the thing that he doesn't like about the Soviet Union is actually the nation building. Um, Lenin's acknowledgement of the forces of modern nationalism and acknowledgement that it needed to be neutralized in a way uh, that would look to the rest of the world as legitimate by creating uh, tiny nation states in the making for the republics. This is what Mr. Putin does not like. So then he is not restoring the Soviet Union. Rather, he is thinking of restoring the Russian Empire as it existed before 1917. But even this, perhaps, is not a very good definition of what he is trying to do, because really, um, with an eye to what is happening in Ukraine now, today, this week, it's beginning to look like, increasingly, like the collapse of Yugoslavia and the civil war which took place in the 1990s there. Because there, it was not really about recovering the entire former constituent units of the federation. 
but rather only those parts of these republics that were populated by ethnic Serbs. So it then becomes um, a genocidal style, extremely violent reconstitution of states based on an ethnic criteria. And of course, you need to have this ethnic criteria in, in the picture in order to have a genocide, right? So, so we know already that uh, if somebody starts rearranging territories and states and borders based on this criteria, genocide is a possibility. And that's, that's why we should, in fact, take this claim rather seriously, uh, which is now acknowledged by a variety of Western players. So, um, not, not the Soviet Union as such, but rather the Russian Empire with elements of Yugoslavia, of the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, which is what makes it very dangerous. Um, then perhaps the most widespread misconception about it, and I have added to creating this misconception as a historian, especially on various round tables when I'm surrounded by other historians, and we historians always want to argue for the importance of history is, of course, that this conflict is about the past. And that's the most difficult to uh, explain for me, if only because that takes time. Talking about the past does take quite a bit of time. So <clears throat> is it really about history? Well, Russia and Ukraine do share a lot of history. Both of them claim the uh, important medieval empire, which historians are calling Kiev and Rus. Both of them claim it as the foundation of uh, history of statehood and nationhood. Um, but then, of course, Ukraine gets separated at some point. The lands that are going to become Ukraine are separated after the Mongol invasion. And they share a significant part of historical experience with what we can call, in quote unquote, Europe. As part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, uh, later the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, later for some of them, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they experience the influences that are not really present in Russian history at all, or until very recently. And that is because by virtue of being part of the polish lithuanian Commonwealth, for instance, um, the population of the Russinian lands, the future Ukrainians, learn about the rights and freedoms, learn about the social contract of sorts, which exists between the ruler and the ruled, and imposes obligation on both sides. Um, they learn how to define the corporate rights, corporate meaning a social estate, a social group with clearly defined rights and responsibilities. And this is all about preparing for the modern notion of citizenship, for the modern notion of nationhood, and ultimately democracy is born from the historical process which begins with that. Ukraine also experienced, interestingly enough, um, cultural influences absent in Russian history. Um, Ukraine has some um, influences of Gothic, Gothic architecture, uh, Renaissance and Reformation. These things that Russian historians really wanted to have and were looking for them and trying to incorporate them into Russian history until, of course, Mr. Putin came to power, at which point everything about the West is evil. And that truly is the explanation Mr. Putin offered in his historical article in the summer of 2021, that yes, um, the historical experience of Ukraine has been somewhat different from that of Russia. But that was because of the West, because the West constantly wanted to separate, to detach this part of the Russian nation from it and corrupt it. This, of course, um, is also a very recognizable trope, which you encounter a lot in the 19th century uh, for those doing the Russian intellectual history of the 19th century, the notion of the West as a corrupting force. And also I have to say, if we do extend this parallel, uh, the Russian Empire, the conservative force, uh, was extremely happy to project itself as a conservative force. And the Russian Tsars very clearly said that, yes, the West is corrupt, the West is decadent and the West is dangerous, but they very clearly explained why. Because of the revolutions. And so the so-called bourgeois democratic revolutions in Europe in the 1830s and 1848 is precisely what the Tsars were afraid of. That's precisely why they wanted to keep 
the concept of the Russian nation as a truly Christian, extremely conservatively Christian, and to keep it uh, ideally even without the factories, because the factories bring about pro the proletariat and the proletariat brings about the street barricades and then it begins and then democracy kicks in at some point. So Nicholas I of Russia was extremely reluctant to industrialize his country until he was defeated in the Crimean War. So there is then this history, which once we start talking about it becomes increasingly more like you know, the imperial hierarchy really, and the attempt to reclaim your past, not just from Ukraine, but from the world, and an attempt to position Russia as the only leading conservative Christian voice. Of course, Mr. Putin insists that his regime is the only truly conservative Christian regime in the world. I wonder what his discussions with Mr. Trump were like, because Trump was also making similar points, but to Putin, not strongly enough. All right, so, so much for history then. The history is shared, but the Russian narrative of this history is such that Ukraine has constantly been um, attacked by the West with the intention of separating it from Russia. And then, of course, the most perhaps puzzling development of the last few days, in fact, I think it was reported in um, North America only yesterday, um, is that um, the Russian forces occupying parts of Ukraine are actually doing very strange things there. Uh, in one town in southern Ukraine, they have restored the Lenin monument. Now, that's slightly strange because Mr. Putin very clearly accuses Lenin of having created Ukraine artificially. Because, of course, Lenin, as you remember, recognized the forces of nationalism, recognized the importance of national self-determination as a slogan, recognized that you can have your puppet state and call it the Ukrainian Republic. Now, Mr. Putin accuses Lenin of having done so uh, intentionally in order to create Ukraine from various Russian lands. Now, the question is, if Lenin is so bad, and Mr. Putin is quite consistent that Lenin is bad, so I'm quite I'm used to see uh, some Western leftists uh, defending Putin, because Putin is, of course, the extreme Christian conservative right, um, extremely right wing. So he doesn't like Lenin at all. Uh, he does like Stalin, but he likes Stalin for a different reason, for the reason of having created a nuclear power, of having won, allegedly on his own, uh, World War II without any allies. Um, of, by virtue of, you know, having shown the West its place, because in the Russian version of what Stalinism is, this is the explanation that Stalin has shown the West its place. And that's what Putin would like to repeat as well. So why would, why on earth would they rebuild the Lenin monument? And also they did some other funny things, such as bringing lots of reproductions of the red banner, which was raised over the Reichstag, the German parliament in 1945 um, by Soviet soldiers. You know, this famous doctored photograph of uh, three Soviet soldiers uh, installing, installing uh, the red flag over, over the ruined Berlin. Um, and of course, it was doctored because in the original photograph, you could see that the soldier was the soldier who was holding the other one had like uh, four watches on his hand because he has been looting and probably raping and killing. Um, but too many watches on one hand was not good, so it was doctored a little bit. So the Russians made tons of copies of this flag. They're quite obsessed actually with presenting themselves as forever righteous because they have won World War II. And they started installing these flags over administration buildings in Ukraine. So it's a completely strange combination. And of course, the explanation here is that, yes, they like some parts of the Soviet experience, but definitely not all parts of the Soviet experience. But they have to acknowledge that the people on the ground have a different opinion. And so restoring Lenin when Putin hates Lenin is actually the answer to the history of the Ukrainian revolution in 2013-2014, because destroying the Lenin statues was the defining moment of that revolution. The revolutionaries, of course, did not rebel against communism. Communism was long gone. They rebelled rather against the Russian influence, 
and against authoritarianism, which is seen as emanating from Russia and promoted from Russia, and rightly so. And that is why the revolutionaries attacked the Lenin statues. That is also why um, some people in southern and eastern Ukraine um, tried to defend the Lenin statues. That makes no sense, right? Putin hates him. But to them, it was a symbol of the Soviet Union, which for them was something to think about nostalgically. So the irony is that the Russian message needed to be adjusted to the expectations built up by the Ukrainian pro-Russian parties in the decade before the revolution. This resulted in an extremely hybrid field of historical memory. Therefore, they restore Lenin. Therefore, they bring the flags from the war because the flags are actually part of the Putin design. The Lenin statue is not part of the Putin design, but the local uh, pro-Russian activists think that it would work fairly well. And so at this point, I need to address, of course, the question of what it really is about. Um, and the answer is going to be that it's not truly about history or the past, but it is about the ways you imagine the past. It's about the ways you tell your history. So that's why the red flags. That's why the revolutionaries are presented as Nazis. So it's important for Putin then to replay this particular invasion as a sort of reincarnation, reenactment of World War II in his particular very strange version. That's why the red flags. And so it's important also for him to denounce the enemies as quote unquote Nazis, whether they are Nazis or not. I'm sure all of you know by now that the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, is of Jewish background. It's very difficult to present him as a Nazi. And that was a major, major miscalculation on the Russian part. But it's also a sort of misunderstanding uh, here between the West and, and uh, Mr. Putin's logic. To the West, you cannot possibly be Nazi if you are Jewish and the grandson of the Holocaust survivor. To Russia, you can be a Nazi if you are pro-Western, because this is really the way the term Nazi is used in Putin's Russia. In this very strange picture of World War II, which currently is official orthodoxy in Russia, the West is pro-Nazi. The West is fighting on the other side. So Russian history textbooks go at great lengths to, to present the Soviet Union as the only righteous part, and of course the Russians as the only representation of the Soviet Union, which is problematic in a variety of ways. But the Nazism is not defined by kind of real Nazism. It's defined by who your enemy is. And so if your enemy is the West, and in this particular case, Mr. Putin's enemy happens to be democracy in his own country, as well as in Ukraine and elsewhere in the world. And of course, you know that he can attack the world as well by trying to manipulate the elections, interfere in all kinds of Internet things and such. So if we accept, and that I think is the only viable explanation, that to Mr. Putin, Nazism means democracy, then everything suddenly falls into places. Then it makes perfect sense that Ukraine's Jewish president, who was popularly elected with colossal landslide, is the supreme Nazi. Well, that's because he was actually elected. He went through this democratic process, and this process was approved by the West. Therefore, all of them are Nazis. Okay, that sounds good. So what then is really going on with Mr. Putin? What is going on there is that his own people are also Nazis. Not all of them, but mostly young professionals who reside in the cities, those who in 2011 and 2012 went out to protest Mr. Putin's continued rule when it became clear that he is going to play this game forever, rewriting the constitution or um, switching seats with Mr. Medvedev in order to remain in power forever. So there were mass rallies in Moscow and St. Petersburg and some other Russian cities because the social stratum of young professionals, people who are on the internet, people who travel around the world, they felt that that was wrong. And so Mr. Putin then declared the war on his own society. And, and we see the consequences of this war now. The consequence is actually quite scary. 
Stalin liked atomizing society. He was quite good at atomizing societies, and the terror was an instrument for that. Mr. Putin actually did some very important things recently, which uh, have been reported in Western media, so all of us realize what it is. He closed any channels for the potential civic society to emerge. It's impossible to protest in Russia if you are part of the group, and that's why the Russians we see on photographs in the Western media, they're standing one by one, um, holding small posters. If you're standing too close, shoulder to shoulder to the other person, you are a group. It's a different, uh, a different criminal case. Um, the internet is now controlled. There was a long road to that. There is no opposition in the parliament. There is no oppositional press. They really kept only three um, media representing the oppositional press, really marginal and really questionable also in terms of whether they really were oppositional. Uh, but by now, all of them are closed as well or abroad. Um, in fact, I experienced this moment in a very personal way because I gave a long interview to the uh, Russian new newspaper, Novaya Gazeta, just before the start of the war. And this entire special issue was basically banned by censors. Um, and the newspaper then decided not to cover the war at all. And then it was banned anyway. So this is what is happening in Russia. It means um, Mr. Putin then is not just enemies with some imaginary Nazis in the Ukrainian leadership. He's basically enemies with entire Ukrainian society. That is the problem for him. The Ukrainian society is politically mobilized, extremely so. It is powerful as a civic society, much more powerful than the state in Ukraine. And that's the trouble. The state was quite weak for a while, um, also quite corrupt, to be honest with you, and chaotic in a variety of ways. But the society was extremely well organized. And it was organized not along the ethnic lines, as Mr. Putin imagines, right? Because the Russian media is not allowed to actually speak of uh, Ukrainian citizens of various ethnic backgrounds and religious backgrounds fighting against the Russian army. Um, in the Russian media, you would see that they are either the Nazis or the nationalists who are fighting because the good Ukrainians who are fundamentally, of course, Russians, they cannot possibly be fighting. They're waiting for Mr. Putin to arrive and atomize a society, they basically create create this quicksand society in which, in which there is no possibility of building any strong resistance. So that is then the problem. The problem really is not so much with President Zelensky, but with Ukrainians in general. And we have seen what Ukraine has done, right? Um, a total mobilization of society, everybody is volunteering. People are raising so much money for the army. The army is basically supplied, I think, um, even now when the West um, kicked in finally with, with really significant help. Um, the small things for the army, like the uniforms, like the um, small equipment, is provided basically by volunteers who collect the money, purchase things and deliver them, knowing that the army can still be perhaps corrupt and actually deliver them to the units. They, work directly with the units. It is this type of social mobilization that Russia is really, really afraid of. And it calls it, of course, Nazism. And then what it means is that Nazism is democracy. But ultimately, um, I think my last point, given uh, how much time I've spent already going through this, my last point is probably going to be this. Um, I sort of argued that it's not really about history. It's about the way you see history. Like Stalin is very differently seen in Ukraine and Russia, but that is of course not just about historical memory. It's about the way you see the present and the future. Um, so if you see human rights as important and democracy is important, then Stalin obviously is going to be a, the bad guy of your narrative. And that's precisely who he is in Ukraine the defining feature of Ukrainian narrative about Stalinism is actually the Ukrainian famine, the Holodomor of 1932-33, a genocide organized by Stalin. Whereas on the other side, on the Russian side, Stalin consistently is ranked as one of the top, if not the top, historical personality. So he's fundamentally good 
in part because he won World War II, but also he showed the West its place and gave us a nuclear bomb and, and such, right? So um, history, what, what we see here then is that the way you talk about the past, the way you imagine the past is, of course, intimately connected to your ideas of the present and future. And it sort of makes sense, even at a very simple level of, you know, everyday conversation, a small talk somewhere at the reception. If you like Stalin, then obviously you're going to like Putin. If you live in the Putinist state, then you will be taught to appreciate Stalin precisely because it supports your version of history. And the other way around in Ukraine, if it's not a dictatorship, if it's actually a very powerful society, then you would be told different truths about history, about um, the terror, about the famine, about the resiliency, and also the history of World War II, interestingly enough, is going to be um, in the um, form of tragedy. The framing would be of tragedy. And of course, the Ukrainian history of World War II is very complex. It involves collaboration, it involves two streams of resistance to the Nazis. Uh, it was all kinds of things. So it's really not um, unilinear. It's kind of multipolar. And that is good because then you see it as tragedy. You look for responsibility. You look for humanity in this story of tragedy. And it also allows you um, to prioritize notions of uh, human rights, of the value of every human life, whereas the Russian narrative of World War II remains a triumphant Stalinist narrative. We have won the mighty state, the great leader. So then the casualties do not matter that much. And then of course the notion of human rights and the value of every individual life takes a second seat, if not a third one. So fundamentally then, I'm sorry, I said it was going to be my last point. I'm still trying to arrive to my last point. Ah, yes. So my last point is then going to be this. It's actually a very interesting war in which one side insists on the categories from the mid 20th century being definitive still. And what I mean is, of course, Mr. Putin's assumption that there is ethnic affinity between Ukrainians and Russians and Ukrainians in general, or at the very least, those who speak Russian at home, or at the very least, those who are of ethnic Russian background, would love his army and would embrace his regime just because of blood and soil. Yeah, that sounds familiar, blood and soil. So it's kind of the 1930s, early 1940s kind of understanding of how the world functions. And of course, I was Im immensely <laughs> disappointed when this did not happen because modern political communities, modern nations are political communities. They emerge based on the shared ideal, not necessarily an ethnic one, and in most cases, not an ethnic one. And of course, the Ukrainian revolution was fought in a way which made it um, a very much non-ethnic revolution, no matter what the Russian representations you encounter in the media, the revolution was started by an Afghan Ukrainian journalist who started it with a Facebook post. Um, the most recognizable face of the revolution became an Armenian Ukrainian who was killed early on. And of course, now we have the Jewish president. That means the Ukrainian revolution was not at all about ethnicity. It was about a different type of political community for which, you know, struggle against corruption and for democracy are way more important and definitive. But that means it is a society of the early 21st century, which is at war with a country which wants to drag it back into the mid 20s, into the 1930s and 40s. So that means we know who is going to win. Problem is, it's probably going to cost quite a lot uh, for my native country. And so every bit of support and pressure and sanctions is very much appreciated. I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. We'll um, have some time for questions now. Um, Lindsay, have any come in? Not yet. Yet? But yeah, you can use the chat um if you're uh if you're here and we can put them through okay um 
so hey, uh, to get us started off, um, I know one thing that you and I have uh, discussed a bit is the likely timeline of um, uh, combat in uh, Ukraine. Um, what are your thoughts about what the next few weeks or months might hold for the conflict um, as it, it's, it's currently playing out? I think we, we see here history redefined, really. Um, not only that we are back in the Cold War, which some of us remember, but also the way modern wars are fought, because that's a kind of curious war, which is a combination of 20th century conventional warfare with something very modern, uh, information technologies, drones flying over and such. So I think the assumption of, both, of most specialists in the field was that modern wars don't last for too long. They're usually several weeks. And then there is some kind of settlement or they become frozen conflicts. And Ukraine has had this experience of this particular conflict on the Russian border becoming a frozen conflict. That was the expectation early on, which I have shared. But it now turns out that um, the war is actually unfolding according to slightly different scenario. It seems that the specialists were right and the Russian army gets stuck at some point, exhausted, uh, poorly supplied and such. So it can go on for about a month and then it needs a break. And now we see the resumption of intensive fighting, which we know is not going to last for too long. But what we don't know is how long the next break is going to be. So at some point, the hope is that Mr. Putin would realize that, OK, so he can have this small, tiny local victory, let's say, in Mariupol. Also, my heart is bleeding for Mariupol, but nevertheless. And by the way, Angela, of course, we have a picture of the Ukrainian soldiers standing in front of the Mariupol plant, uh, uh, which is actually the center of fighting now. So we, you know, prophetically, unfortunately, a bad omen I put this picture on the on the cover of the second edition there um, so there's there was a break and then the fighting is resuming we know it's not going to it's not going to last for more than a month then we know there's going to be a break uh, then at some point mr putin's political appetite will be satisfied or he will present it as the victory and that really is a hope and i feel really badly about saying this but the only way um, to end this war is to make it such uh, that the dictator can present the status quo as of that moment as his victory. Um, and we are hoping this can happen anytime, really. It can happen within a week. But I think it's more likely that there would be a break and possibly more fighting. It could be a month, two months. And of course, the cruel irony is Ukraine can sustain a long war because the people are willing. There is a very high morale, but that would mean basically extermination of the entire generation of uh, young and not, not so young Ukrainian men and women, lots of women in the army as well. What are your thoughts? Um, I know there's been a lot of uh, a lot of opinions about how the, the West has responded to the war, um, particularly the Biden administration. Um, wondering uh, what your thoughts are about um, how the United States uh, in particular has responded and if you um, think that uh, there are better or other ways that we should be thinking about responding. I'm actually quite happy with the response of the United States, not so much of my native Canada here. Um, even so, even so, Canada has a very significant share of Ukrainian Canadian population. Uh, the American Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian American population is even larger numerically, but proportionately, the share of population much smaller than in Canada. In Canada, of course, Ukrainians have a real political voice. There was a scary moment for me and everybody else. The first three or four days of the war when it became extremely clear that the West, the collective West, has told Ukraine that we are going to sit and watch basically what happens. Um, what was encouraging was that very clearly um, the Americans and the British were sharing intelligence with Ukraine from the very first days. 
but they needed to see Ukraine's resilience. Uh, and that was the moment when all of us suddenly hearts jumped and like, oh my God, what is going to happen now? Now that we know Ukraine is resilient, I think the response of the West is excellent. It is excellent in a variety of ways. Uh, Ukrainians are quite upset with Europe, actually, I have to say, especially with the European Union. I'm sorry if there are any uh, citizens of the European Union countries here. Not all of them. Poland has shown itself a true sister. And that's actually quite good as well. I was asked at one public lecture about the response of Europe, and I said that there is a social on social media. There's a meme uh, in Ukraine um, about um, Ukraine having no brothers because the traditional ideology of fraternal nations was that uh, Russia is a big brother of Ukraine. And now, of course, uh, we have no brothers, but we have a sister, a European sister, and that is Poland. Everybody is actually very happy with Boris Johnson. I apologize for saying this in case it uh, kind of uh, rattles your feathers. Some of some of us uh, in the UK, but he's enormously popular in Ukraine right now. Could be elected the next president of Ukraine easily, or even the monarch of Ukraine if he wanted to. Um, or even we could maybe join the British Commonwealth at first and then, you know. Um, uh, quite upset really with, with Germany and especially with Europeans for being addicted to the Russian gas and not realizing the lesson of history that, you know, you cannot uh, depend in your economic needs on a crazy dictator. So some would have thought that it was learned, the lesson was learned in the 1930s, but apparently not. So the addiction to the Russian gas basically means that we have this wonderful sanctions but essentially, we are paying Russia so much that all these sanctions are sort of neutralized by the fact of how many billions uh, weekly, daily, goes into Russia's payments for its natural resources. I think, I think the American response was actually very appropriate. What I find interesting, though, is that apparently there was a signal from the Biden administration that they realized that this war is going to define his presidency. And I said, oh, 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 no, wait a minute. When was the last time the war defined American presidency? Vietnam, Korea, those didn't, didn't end well, actually. And come to think of it, the recent withdrawal from Afghanistan wasn't particularly glorious either. Well, that was a bit of a scary moment, but I think the response of the West is good. And I'm particularly heartened by the response of individual people in the West. It's not just the governments. Governments can have all kinds of agendas, but it's actually the individuals who realize we don't deal with uh, this or that political regime in Ukraine. We actually deal with a mass movement of people, the society trying to save itself uh, from an authoritarian neighbor who wants to swallow it. Uh, and that caused also the kind of response which is appropriate in that it is highly individualized, like everybody is included into this. People do it as, as groups here in Canada, lots of small groups actually sending money to this or that cause in Ukraine. And I found it actually curious. They don't want to go through official channels. They even don't, don't want a tax receipt because they think it will end up in warehouses somewhere in Central Europe, whatever. So the kind of reaction the Ukrainians demonstrated also then caused a similar response from the West. Hey, Angela, I put some questions through. Are you able to see them? Great. Oh, uh, I am not. Uh, let's Sorry, see. thought you were nodding. I preempted that. Um, I can read them, but if you know, I'm happy to. Yeah, actually, if you don't mind reading them, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so we have a two part question from Stefan. Is there any historical basis for the argument that ethnic Russians are a persecuted group within the borders of Ukraine? And then he also asks if Georgia or other nations from the Caucasus have officially allied with Ukraine. No and no. <laughs> um, it's one of those mythologies about ethnic Russians being persecuted somehow in Ukraine. And it's also a very kind of telling mythology, right? Because this is exactly how World War II started. Um, the persecutions of ethnic Germans in Poland was used as the, the alleged persecution of ethnic Germans in Poland. Um, Ukraine is a fully bilingual country. It has been slowly switching towards uh, using more Ukrainian in administration, but you can easily use Russian in daily life. 
And um, just to give you a very interesting example, the Ukrainian legislation actually required several years back to have um, 35 percent of Ukrainian music on the radio, which means the rest of it was actually primarily Russian, some Western, but primarily Russian. So that was the that was the moment when everybody was crying about perse persecution of ethnic Russians and it was now changed to 50 and 50. 50 50 uh, and at this point everyone, oh my god this is genocide <laughs> so what does it tell you uh, it's a very recognizable picture it's the imperial hierarchy of cultures our culture is supreme uh yours whatever country folks country you know um country bumpkins as they say here in canada those funny people dancing and singing ukrainians but the real modern music has to be in russian like the real conversation has to be in russian it's very recognizable imperial thing but of course we are in the moment now when lots of universities in britain now have you know bilingual websites um, which is fun which is fun to see because it's the recovery of identity which is indicative of democracy and this is what is happening in Ukraine too. We need to see it this way. It's a decolonization process. Uh, so it's not even a fully bilingual country. It's more like Russian speaking country, which is in the process of recovering. It's Ukrainian half at least. It's not even the Ukrainian most of the time. It's, uh, it's slowly getting somewhere. And I actually feel quite good about this because you know, the Russian empire banned the Ukrainian language it's very difficult to make an argument from the Kremlin that the Russian language needs to have even more rights. I mean, there are plenty of ethnic Russians in Ukraine. Well, I am one of them. Like, I really don't protest. Neither does my mom. Um, so that's the empire behind this argument. And we know by now what it means. Um, the other the other states in a very peculiar situation, unfortunately, Georgia and Armenia. Well, first of all, Georgia also has the Republic of Georgia. Americans always think it's a state of Georgia. So um, the Republic of Georgia has a significant part of its territory now occupied by Russia. They are not in a position to, but at the same time, they're pretty much geographically and politically isolated there in the Caucasus. So they also depend on some kind of trade with Russia. So they now have the government, which is more pro-Russian, but the overwhelming majority of Georgians actually are not. So that's the paradox. We are trying to figure that one out. Armenia, Armenia unfortunately continues the pro-Russian line. Also recently when it came to the reports that they transfer the um, aircraft and crew to Russia to fight in Ukraine. They denied that and made a statement condemning the invasion. So these, these uh, countries are in a very complex situation, really. And you know what? What happened just before Ukraine was, of course, the Russian involvement in Kazakhstan. Basically, engineering a coup in Kazakhstan, uh, which they thought was a signal of how mighty Russia is. But it really, to me, was a signal of uh, how not how asleep in the wheel China was really because China should have reacted before that and, and more strongly. Um, so they thought they could do things in the post-Soviet space and they still think so. The scary part of it is that some of the post-Soviet space of course is now in the NATO, the Baltic states. Latvia is vulnerable, Estonia is vulnerable. They're the smallest, the, the weakest members. So. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here. From what you know about the media landscape, do you think there are any ways of getting accurate information to the pe Russian people and would they be ready to listen? That is a big problem. We are now back in the, the Cold War mode. Some of us remember what the Cold War was like. I grew up in the Soviet Union listening to the Western broadcasts. BBC, The Voice of America, uh, Radio Liberty, all these things. They were cool. They had musical sections that were exciting. They were reading novels, actually novels by Solzhenitsyn. This is how I found out about Solzhenitsyn by listening to BBC, actually, the Russian program. So we need to fight this war again. Difficulty is that, of course, the Russian government now wants to criminalize the use of VPN 
So it would be actually very difficult. Um, they cannot see. They send signals that they allegedly can see what what is transferred through VPN secure connection, but they are trying to ban it uh, to make it a criminal offense. So they want to completely control the Internet. Of course, China is on its way to doing exactly the same thing. So they are maybe comparing the notebooks on how to do that. They have managed to atomize society. There is no political force right now which would be able to organize any potential mass movement. Uh, the Russian media, it, the one which is abroad, Medusa, I think, is the most uh, the most um, kind of the boldest of them. They also actually seem to have imposed self-imposed limitations, difficult to access them. And what I find most painful is that even so they are free of censorship and they are abroad, they still have to post these notices that you always find in the Russian press. The Russian media is all about notices. Um, the organization which created this text um, has been designated by the Russian Federation as a foreign agent. And they keep posting it. Of course they are foreign agent, they are banned, they are abroad. Why do you do that? And then they, and then they, uh, and of course the Russian media has to add asterisks to almost everything saying this organization is banned in the Russian Federation, this movement is banned, this term is banned in the Russian Federation. It's, it's completely insane. So, um, and of course most of, most of the people fighting in Ukraine come from depressed economic regions, many of them in, in the Asian part of Russia, where the, there are no jobs, there is no opportunity for young men in particular, really. Um, these people would be very difficult to reach. And um, I am not particularly optimistic about uh, a Russian revolution anytime soon, I'm sorry. Thank you. There's a, a somewhat related question, so I think we'll go to this one. Could you share your thoughts about how Zelensky is navigating his identity as a native Russian speaker and Russian TV celebrity? Do you think he's managing or will manage to sway public opinion in Russia? In Russia or in Ukraine? In Russia, I think. In Russia. The question, yeah. Well, there is a lot here. <laughs> I think, well, okay, to start with, Zelensky has a gift with the languages. So he came into office with almost no Ukrainian, really. He was struggling um, to read from a prompter even. But his Ukrainian is very good right now. And he has been making very significant progress with English, which is good. Finally, we have a president who is able to learn while in office. This hardly ever happens, even in other countries, even in democracies. Um, he also emerges, of course, as you realize, as an important wartime leader, as a figure. I'm not sure what this is going to mean after the war. And people are talking a lot about actually Churchill, about what the first election after the war is going to bring to Zelensky. Because there are political struggles in Ukraine which are now suspended, but they will be revealed in full extent as soon as the war is over. So we'll see what that would make. There are already voices about um, a strong general could be a great candidate in the future. Oh no, please don't go this route. Um, now in Russia, I think um, Russia is a curious state in this respect because of all this imperial nostalgia, which is propagandized by the Russian media. It is actually quite difficult to have a serious reputation if you are not a great leader or a great victim. That's very Russian way actually of looking at it. If you are a great leader, then great, fantastic. Everybody loves you. Um, you can also be a great victim, a person who is constantly persecuted, who is in prisons, in prison most of the time, who has been poisoned twice or three times, right? And that is sort of the background from which you can emerge. The Ukrainian phenomenon was precisely that Zelensky, a comedian, a small, you know, um, what's this term for defining uh, Charlie Chaplin's charisma? Uh, a small man, I think, was kind of a little guy with big heart who has big dreams. That's the kind of Zelensky charisma. I don't think it would work in Russia. The reason it worked in Ukraine is precisely because in Ukraine the society matters. So they went for the everyday person, for the ordinary person. Uh, so he represents something much greater than himself. Whereas in Russia, I don't think it would work. It would have to be a charismatic leader who spent a lifetime in the gulag, or it would have to be a crazy dictator who won like 10 wars against the West, something like that. I'm sorry, but 
that's what it looks like to me at the present. Thank you. Um, we've gotten a couple questions and I uh, about this topic, and I wonder if maybe you could just speak generally to, you know, Angela asked at the beginning about what you think the next couple of weeks look like, and people have asked what you think Ukraine will look like in five years or so. So one of the specific questions was, will we see a Ukraine that's lost part of eastern Ukraine and Crimea, but is fully in NATO and the EU? Um, what are your thoughts about, I guess, sorry to like ask <laughs> multi-part questions, uh, you know, what, what do you think that uh, this will look like post-Putin? Okay, there's one piece of good news. Ukraine is going to remain in the news for a while, for a long while. And that's a signal to those of you who are working with me on my various book projects. It's going to last. Um, there's also bad news. I don't think Ukraine is going to regain control over uh, parts of its territory. It's never going to recognize, of course. It's never going to sign a peace treaty in which it basically you know, surrenders the Crimea and the Donbass to Russia, but it may well be the de facto settlement. Um, and that's, I think, why the peace negotiations were progressing in this direction, but we are not going to recognize it, but we are going to informally tell you that we would not make war to recover uh, the Crimea as such. Um, Ukraine is going to be a very interesting place going forward. If you remember the history of the Cold War, it's going to be a bit like West Germany after World War II and Japan, and a bit like South Korea after the Korean Wars. It's going to be an interesting place, uh, probably very dynamic. Um, it's going to be built up by the West as a, what's the term for that? Shop window, shop window uh, turned towards Russia. So that Russians look at Ukraine and say, oh, they have these goodies, or oh, they have this thing called democracy and presidents actually change and they live well. So maybe in the long run that might work. I'm sort of hopeful. Uh, Ukraine is going to be also quite a bit like Israel. It's going to be an ally of the United States outside of NATO framework with a very strong army, a very well armed army as well to prevent any subsequent invasions from Russia. Uh, that makes me slightly worried about what kind of democracy Ukraine is going to be. I'm really seriously hopeful that Zelensky wins a second term and he goes on uh, transforming the country and that the West is going to stay in, in the picture, uh, supervising this transition so that there is no corruption, whatever. Um, that's about all I can predict based on my you know, educated guesses as a historian. Historians are not particularly good about predicting the future, I'm afraid. Neither are pundits, so. Um, Angela, it looks like we're at 12 o'clock. Um, we do have a few more questions, but I think we should wrap up. Oh. I just realized I'm muted. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sophie. Uh, I really do appreciate the time that you've spent here today with us and um, sharing your um, knowledge about Ukraine. Um, I know it's very personal. Um, issue for you, and I, I do appreciate your taking the time to share with us today. So, and thank you everybody who joined us. Have a good thank day. you so much. Thank you so much. It was actually very, very, a very interesting experience. I don't often give 30 minute talks. <laughs> Professors are programmed to go for 60 or 90 minutes. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for forcing me to do this once. Of course. Okay. Take care. Bye bye.